Hey everybody, uh, we've spent a lot of time so far talking about the imperialism era of the United States from 1890 to 1920, give or take. Uh, and from here we're going to move now and look at the progressives. So the progressives are one of my favorite times in all of history, actually. Uh, the progressives are, uh, they try to fix the changes we talk about, you know, all the problems we talk about in class. We did a little activity in class, the sound discussion looking at all the problems that were going on in social issues, economic, environmental all that kind of stuff. We're going to see how they try to fix those going forward here. We talked about the muckrakers already uh, early on, and you've probably seen a slide before. We're going to bring them up again here. These guys, the muckrakers, were trying to fix problems, okay? They were uh, the peer of social justice, trying to make equality happen. And they want to make things fair for people. And the best way these educated people could do it, since most of our progressives were educated people uh, who were from the middle class, they had jobs like writers and journalists. And so they tried to find ways to promote those things through their fields. So muckrakers were journalists who were trying to publish articles, give attention to problems they saw out there in the world. And we talked about Upton Sinclair before. He wrote a book called The Jungle. And here's the cover of The Jungle, uh, a copy of it. Very interesting book. And it's a story of an immigrant family, a Polish immigrant family in Chicago working in the meatpacking industry. Chicago being the, the main area of meatpacking in the country. And it went to a lot of things. The biggest thing it went to was food safety and how, what things really went on in making uh, meat products back in this time. Things like sick cows with infected sores on that kind of stuff. Um, bones and rat droppings and severed thumbs, those kind of things being dropped into hamburger. Um, something called potted ham, which was the worst parts, most disease, rotting parts of the animals chopped up and put into a can and sold as like a potted ham or a canned ham. All those kind of things were brought to light in the jungle. And he actually, and uh, Sinclair actually spent time in these factories to make his book. And he actually saw it with his own eyes. He also talked about immigrant treatment, the political machines, if you will, the machines who came in and gave the workers day, a day off to go and vote and that kind of stuff, how the unions were being put down. One of the biggest things this, this whole book led to was well, it started something called the FDA or the Food and Drug Administration. Today, all foods, all pharmaceuticals have to go through the FDA. This was started because of, of, of Upton Sinclair. And it was uh, passed in the law later on by Teddy Roosevelt uh, after Upton Sinclair published The Jungle in 1906. So Ida Tarball before. She was part of the economic movement here. She was one who researched Standard Oil and published these articles about how Standard Oil was uh, using these trusts to gain a monopoly. And as part of her work, later on, led Teddy Roosevelt to help break, start breaking up the trusts um, later on. And she, her writing led to basically the eventual breakup of Standard Oil. Lincoln Stephens, talking about him before, too, from St. Louis. He was kind of a, he had read a lot of works about, like, um, socialist, communism, Marxism, those kind of things. And he basically looked at how, who was controlling the cities and how very controllable the condition of the cities and how it was about the political machines, the rich guys who were in government, getting rich, those kind of things. And he told his stories about, you know, politics and who was running the show, how they really didn't care what people were going on, the the tenements and the bad housing, those kind of things. And you really try to get an emotional response from people, telling how bad things were, how we can fix it, how we can get the machines out of government, and that kind of stuff. And so Lincoln Stephens played a big role in that way. One of my favorite people from this time was a lady named Nellie Bly. She was one of the first ever investigative reporters. And her big goal was to help the mentally ill. This time, if you acted any kind of strangeness, it might be some kind of, you had, you know, depression, anxiety, if you had um, bipolar, you were locked in what's called mental into a mental institution. You had some kind of madness, and you were locked in what's called madhouse. And so she wanted to try and help the mental ill out. So she actually faked being crazy, so she'd be locked up in a mental institution. She looked in a mirror and and, and faked these spaz attacks, these, uh, you know, these attacks that she would have where she would go crazy and try to get the um, courts to put her into an institution, and it worked. She actually stayed in this institution for 10 days and kind of you know, learned what it was like in these places. And while she was in there, she talked about the terrible food. It was like beef fat and, and gruel and the na and nasty that they were fed. How people were like tied together so they wouldn't do anything. The dirtiness, the rats, the disgusting things going on. It was basically like a prison. It wasn't really a hospital. It was more like a prison than anything. And she published this book called 10 Days in a Madhouse. And all this money was put into, you know, hundred thousand dollars to put into find ways to have the health of the mentally ill. And even make sure that the right people that um, need to be institutionalized were being institutionalized versus the wrong people. Just if you had something wrong with you, oh, mentally ill, you're wrong. Well, maybe not. Maybe there's other things that are going on. There's also Lewis Hine. I like Lewis Hine. 
Hines a lot. And Lewis Hines, this guy here, was a photographer. And his, a lot of his pictures were about child labor. He took these pictures here, which are stirring pictures about child labor. You have this little dude over here who was working in a, in a, in a coal mine, wearing a coal miner's outfit, just how tired he looks, how hard he looks, the, the, the coal dust in the face. You have a little girl here next to this big, huge loom, working on those looms and that kind of thing, how unhappy she looks, how tired she looks. This little dude right here who looks like exhausted, who I believe is either working on a farm or a coal mine, trying to show how bad child labor was and how bad work was for some of these kids. You talk about three big goals, okay? There are social goals, democratic goals, and economic goals to fix the problem, okay? How you're, how you're change economics, how you change social problems, how you change democratic problems. And social welfare came down to a couple big things. Help for the poor people, help for the unemployed, and help for immigrants. Now, a lot of it came down to settlement housing. We talked about Jane Addams last, uh, a couple years ago, how she helped form the, the settlement houses. And the settlement houses, like this little thing here, were big ideas, okay? Free classes for people, okay? It was free classes for immigrants. Language, learn English, learn all the other kind of stuff that people go in and, and learn about. During this time, we all see new laws being pushed for and being passed. Things like minimum wage. 1912, Massachusetts has the first minimum wage in the country. Um, there's actually, there's no national minimum wage in 1938, but certain states are now starting to pass, uh, laws on minimum wage. Workday. Okay, before you had to have the union to force an eight hour workday. Well, now the government starts putting limits on work hours, including work hours for children. I mean, kids can't be working 14 hours a day. Maybe they can only work eight. You know, eventually work hours as well on other stuff too. Work for the unemployed and the injured. I don't want to put a space, but I put a space there, but, uh, help for the unemployed. Almost kind of the first welfare program so, uh, for that. Also, one of the big social problems we looked at was the idea of behavior and how, and how, and temperance, those kind of things. One of the problem was there's a lot of, a lot of spot, a lot of domestic abuse at this time. A lot of domestic abuse. And it was basically pointing the fingers at like drunk factory workers. That guys would work all day at the factory. They would drink after they left the factory, then get drunk and beat their wives and kids. And it was very typical for men to get a drink at the end of the day. The, the bar, the saloon was usually on the way home from the factory from where they were. And so some people have thought that uh, temperance or prohibition, the idea of outlawing alcohol, would stop that behavior, would stop domestic abuse and those kind of things. And so certain there are movements to stop drinking, like, and usually by uh, women uh, to kind of push these movements. Right here, this picture up here, lips that, that touch liquor shall not touch ours. Basically, women saying that they're not going to marry a deal with guys who drink because it's not right. Um, you'll say carry nation. Uh, Carrie Amelia Moore Nation, who would go around and she would actually bust up jugs of liquor, jugs of beer, jugs of uh, whiskey with her hatchet while citing verses from the Bible about how drinking is bad. And so this big movement for prohibition starts in this time as well. We see education change. You know, the first education was New York City, uh, working and teaching, teaching English, but education this time wasn't the best kind of education. It was still really recitation. It was learning knowledge. So you would have to read something repeated, read something repeated, all kind of stuff, or more memorization than anything. You have John Dewey, who's actually required reading for all teachers right now. And in the 1880s and 90s, he started talking about more hands-on learning, the laboratory school, you will, and how kids need to be involved in education. He really pushed for kids to start learning, getting involved in what they're doing. Like when we do activities or talk in class, that's John Dewey right there. All right? And so he really wanted to and not just you know have kids recite and re repeat stuff. It's all about learning, being hands-on, changing the way we teach kids, making education better, and then making the country better as well. Uh, and in terms of democracy, in terms of changing government, the idea of ending patronage, patronage was a big part of it. Uh, patronage was the idea of giving government jobs to friends and relatives. Basically, if you knew somebody, you got the job. And instead of giving jobs to the best qualified candidates, um, almost kind of like a civil service exam kind of thing, if you will, kind of civil service issue. And so... You know, the political bosses usually ran this thing. They got their person elected. They put their friends, their buddies, their relatives in these nice government jobs. Well, you have to find ways to get around the bosses and bring up the political machines. And some of those jobs were by electing commissioners. Commissioner was a person who would be in charge of a certain field uh, in in government. So you have a police commissioner, city commissioner, those kind of deals. You started electing in city councils who would then pick or hire a city manager. So you could kind of push those uh, political machines out of government. Now, one of Wisconsin's big ways of doing this was something called the primary. Um, in a way to get political machines out of government, you know, political machines would put the candidate up and pay for them. Um, we had what's primary. So, you know, those are the presidential and, gov and governor elections. Uh, you first would have a primary. So, you elect candidates from a certain party to run instead of a boss picking them. And so, people would then select who they want to run. So, there's four candidates 
the, the people would narrow down to then narrow that down to your can at the end. They also, Wisconsin also developed initiative elections, basically that people can suggest laws to go to go to government. They can suggest what kind of thing they should be talking about uh, in the legislature. Wisconsin was the first place to have recall elections. Um, what happened with Scott Walker not too long ago was the idea to recall a politician. We think a politician doing a bad job. You ask for a recall and kick that politician out. They also made referendums so that people vote on the laws directly. So we're trying to push those political machines, those rich guys running government, out of government. Also, the idea of big business. How can you kick big business out of government? Well, one part is breaking up the trust. And then one of those laws was the Antitrust Act of 89, the Sherman Antitrust Act, uh, based on anti-competition laws. Um, the text says you can't inhibit competition, but the idea of using this law to try to help break up monopolies. And they're trying to use, it looks like saying if you're destroying competition, you can't be doing that. Originally, the law did more harm than good. A lot of times it hurt unions, but uh, later on it was used by Teddy Roosevelt to help stop the trust. And Teddy Roosevelt was a big part of this whole deal. He had something called the square deal. Okay, He had three big things he wanted to happen. Con protect the consumers, control the corporations, help conserve the natural resources. And he used the presidency to do this. It's called a bully pulpit. He used the office of the presidency and his exposure as president to push his ideas, these things, onto the people. And one big idea was labor. Uh, there was a big coal strike, 1902, down West Virginia. Okay, and um, you know he basically TR got up there and kind of said, "Well, how are we going to fix this? Okay, how are we going to fix this problem?" Well, he, you know, he eventually he had the you know, coal mine went on strike. You got to you know try to figure out how to make this make the problems fixed. So uh, he decided to have the army work the coal work the coal mine and essentially force the end of the strike. In the end, the workers got a nine hour day, got more pay, but the price of coal had to go up. And so he found ways to uh, fix these labor disputes and make sure that prices stay, you know, okay and workers are protected. And it's trying to find that balance between making sure workers are protected and people are protected. He tried busting up the trust as well. Um, you know, he a big part of this was railroads, okay? Railroads control a lot of the trust and they were doing a lot of the price setting. And so railroads would buy all, all the land, they'd buy up all the market, and they would make a lot of money. Um, because railroads were making these deals to, uh, you know, buying up the market to, to control the shipping prices. And so Teddy used uh, his position as president and something called the Hepburn Act to regulate how interstate railroads set their maximum rates. That maximum rate, rates have to be published in the United States and know what shipping prices are to help protect the farmers, help protect the merchants who are shipping their goods across country. Um, you know, Teddy actually went to Congress and asked Congress to stop the trust. Nothing happened with it. So instead, Teddy actually opened 45 lawsuits against trusts on his own. Okay, he actually targeted. He didn't go through Congress. He went himself and did it using the anti instrument the trust act, other laws like that, to bust up the trust on his own. He kind of got known as this big trust buster. Things like Teddy didn't bust all the trusts. He actually only targeted the dangerous ones, especially the railroads first. Um, Teddy also got involved in immigration. Talked about the General's Agreement, and he was really worried about public losing their job. And that's part of his consumer protection thing. Of why he decided to uh, have his gentleman's agreement with Japan, and you know that Japan would not send people into the United States anymore, and so he kind of decided there's a little bit of protection thing there, and about you know how uh, you know people are, and he also pushed education. Well, he had a core over here that every immigrant who comes here should be required to learn within five years of English to leave the country. Well, as immigration, that was you know part of the public idea there as well, but he did get involved in immigration too. Um, he was also involved in conservation. It's kind of a you know, big thing here is that, you know, Roosevelt being this hunter, outdoorsman kind of guy, he went out west, he went out west to kind of view how timber companies were using the land. Well, they were clear cutting all this land, destroying all this forest, and so Teddy decided to set aside over 194 million acres for natural forests and, 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 and state parks. He also set aside bird refuges, these kind of things, and so the U.S. forest system to run the land. Uh, Gifford, uh, uh, Pinchot here was one of the first guys to use that, you know, using dams for electricity, and irrigation, finding good ways to use the land. Now, he also remember John Muir, who was a Wisconsin Board Preservationist, who wanted to kind of make sure the national parks were in a wild state, where you don't see, you know, rivers and dams and stuff in natural parks to make sure they stay wild, as he met with Teddy Roosevelt. The great little Ro quote, Roosevelt quote here, the conservation of natural resources is a fundamental problem. Once we solve that problem, it will, it will avail us to solve others. He really thought conservation of land was super, super important. There were some places that his square deal didn't do much, though. I mean, TR had nothing against African Americans, but none of his, none of his ideas of square deal really helped African Americans out. It was mostly political to make sure he kept everybody on his side, but in the end, the idea of equality really didn't happen much in terms of TR. 
his uh, goals were not much for that equality kind of stuff. That's it for today.